Well, welcome back to the inside of the Ashtoon studio on a beautiful Thursday morning, uh, June the 24th, 2021. So I've been back for a few days now, had a chance to uh, get everything unloaded, get settled in, and take care of a few things that were very pressing that had, you know, I'd gotten behind on being gone for so long. And also install one of these magnetic screen doors in the studio. And because my walls are metal, I was able to just stick it up with a pack of magnets that I got at Harbor Freight. It was uh, one of the easiest installations and I'm really happy with it. Uh, all right, so it's time now to do an aftermath video to show you all the things that I, I got. We'll go over that and also some announcements and a little surprise at the end if you uh, stick around long enough to see it. Little clue, I'm going to be trying a weird snack. So, all right, let's just get started. I'm a little hungry, so I'm going to be eating my breakfast between takes. So if you see stuff start showing up in my beard, just just forgive me for that because, uh, yeah, I, I was hungry. Okay, first off, let me just say, as far as the first event that I did, the uh, Banks of the Wabash Festival that was at the Wabash Valley Park in Terre Haute, Indiana, I've done that one many times in the past, but this year was different. It was very crowded and a lot busier, and I think that um, was due to just people coming out of lockdown and being restless and ready to get out in the sun and see people and um it was great it was so good and i got a lot of new subscribers from that again i think i've already said this before i'm gonna say it again welcome to all the new subscribers from terra hope you guys were fantastic thank you so much for coming out and spending money on the the drawings and just making the banks of the wabash festival this year this year so awesome, thank you. Uh, okay, so now as far as the other event, uh, the Friendship Flea Market, the new one, uh, I think I've said most everything that I can say about that at the end of the last video, but uh, I'm gonna add a few things to it. Uh, yeah, people were incredibly friendly and very appreciative. And uh, I was amazed by all the people that said that they had been coming to that flea market uh, since they were kids, and now they were bringing their kids. That flea market has got a long history, a long heritage to it. And um, there's something about a show like that, that just, it has that seasoning, that uh, it's, it's, it's not just an event, it's like a part of people's life. It's a part of who they are. And it was so good. And it's a part of me now, too. So I don't see any reason why I wouldn't come back and do that festival again. I can't do it in September. It's it's uh, two times a year, one in, one in June and one in September. I can't do the one this year in September because I've already scheduled a few other things, and that's going to be part of the announcement later on. Um, but I will endeavor to get back there again in June. I couldn't pay ahead to June because you can only pay ahead one show. But as soon as it's available for me to get on that phone and reserve and buy that spot for June of next year, I will do it. And I'm really looking forward to getting back out there and having that nice, um, shady, friendly, chill, uh, fantastic time with all the people out there in, in Friendship India. Okay, I'm going to stop gushing about it. I'm just going to say, all right, all right, let's, let's go on to the acquisitions, what I got there. And we'll start with... The DVDs, and uh, let me just say that for just about everyone, oh, and there's some games down there too. Uh, just about for every one of these, they were a dollar to maybe two dollars. A few of them in here were five dollars. The ones that were a little more rare. So I did not spend a whole lot of money on all this at all. Uh, we're going to start with uh, these two, two seasons of Babylon Five, which was a science fiction TV series that was from the mid '90s. I'm not sure exactly how many seasons it went on. Um, I remember it being like there for a while, so it had to be like five or six seasons, if not more. And I wanted to give it a chance because I like science fiction. But I'm going to be completely honest with you guys. This series is boring. It is. It's so slow and boring that your mind wanders and you start losing track of the different threads. 
um, because you start thinking about other things and then you get lost. So I've made it, I, I started with season two because that was the earliest. So I got the second season and fourth season. Started with season two. I've gotten to uh, halfway through the second disc and I've just started using it for a way to get to sleep. I'm good. <laughs> I just like, oh man, I can't get to sleep. I'll, I'll just put on a DVD of Babylon 5. That'll work. Uh, I'm sure maybe in the mid-90s it was considered exciting, but oof. All right. Uh, probably won't buy any more se uh, seasons of that. All right. Then I got uh, a couple of uh, the, the what is this, 2010's Ninja Turtles? Yeah, this one's just called the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Didn't know this was out there when it was, you know, on TV, but watching it now, and my goodness, this is the closest to what, in my mind, are the Ninja Turtles. The, um, yeah. The, in this one, this is kind of a movie, and it's where the, the 2010's Turtles meet up with the 90's Turtles. And so you kind of get to see the difference between between them, and uh, that was <laughs> that was so much fun to see. It's great. I love that. Um, the Seeker. Now this one has got that. Uh, where is it at? Yeah, you see this that little dove right there. Uh, family approved. So basically, no killing, no blood, no profanity. Uh, very pure. And normally, when you see that little dove, it means it also means incredibly boring. But in this case, not boring. Actually, very riveting. Um, this one, it the the people act like humans. They weren't like boxcar children. They weren't, um, you know, perfect, candy coated. Everybody loves each other. There was um, uh, this main character is the youngest son of seven. He's got seven brothers, uh, six that still. Well, a few of them are coming back from college for the holidays. Anyway, there's a lot of that sibling rivalry and um, bullying and the stuff that he has to deal with at school. And and it's it really feels like real life. Um, and it I was surprised with how good that movie was. Now, this, this one, um, the uh, Lion King one and a half, I actually paid $5 for. Because it was one of the first of the, I think it was, one of the first of the direct-to-DVD sequels. And I think this was early enough that it wasn't quite such a, a, a blatant cash grab. Uh, it was one that they actually put some heart and some work into. And uh, there's and a bonus. There's a bonus DVD in here. And a, a nice big book. Well, big uh, for an insert on a DVD. Anyway. Um... It's actually really funny, really well done, and kind of rare, hard to find. So when I found it complete in mint condition like this, uh, yeah, I went ahead and paid the $5. I wanted to see it again. Uh, Karate Cop. You know, I've got to start a new channel where I just review movies like this. This, uh, <laughs> it, well, well, how, how can I describe this? It, it's bad. But at the same time, you're buying a movie called Karate Cop. Look at the stuff on the back. You know it's going to be bad. And you're and the people acting in it now also know it's kind of bad. And they're just going to have fun with it. And they do. It, it, it's, it's great. <laughs> it's entertaining in that sense where they're just like, well, we're making a movie called Karate Cop, so just screw it. Let's have fun with it. Uh, that's great. It's awesome. Uh, this one... Richard Harris, The Return of a Man Called Horse. And I read the synopsis on the back, and supposedly it's a tribe of Sioux Indians that are being severely persecuted, probably uh, part of that time when um, they're being moved to reservations or something along those lines. So they're fighting for their freedom. And this character here comes in, and uh, it looks like his goal is to try to help them out, according to the, to the synopsis on the back, but at the same time, uh, the pictures have him being tortured and, and then covered in arrows, like he's been shot a few times. So, yeah, maybe he tries to help out, but I don't think they see it that way. It's going to be an interesting thing. It, I mean, just look at that, how grainy that picture is. It was made, like, anyway. All right. Jewel of the Nile. 
because I liked romancing the stone. Uh, Adventure Time, uh, after watching this, I bought a few other cartoon compilations of Adventure Time, and I actually already own most of these episodes. So I think if I was to buy any more Adventure Time, I'm going to get the seasons of it so I don't keep rebuying the same episodes. But it's Adventure Time. It's entertaining as all get out. Um, it's a very Merry Christmas, uh, Muppet Christmas. I love Muppet Christmas. Uh, the Muppets Christmas Carol. There's, they do a really good job with Christmas. Uh, so when Christmas rolls around, I like to have a few of these on hand that I can do like little reviews of while I'm here at the studio for Christmas. And uh, I'm still on the lookout for a Muppet Family Christmas, which has only ever been released on VHS. But this is a nice one to have, too. Uh, and then there's this series of, uh, I think I got the entire box set. This, the box wasn't with it, but I got all the DVDs, and it's one through five. Uh, Astro Boy, and this is the one from the 2010s. Uh, oh, wait, uh, not 2010. It's 2004 on that one. Yeah, 2004. So this is the uh, early 2000s. Uh, and a lot of people, when they think of Astro Boy, they think of that black and white series where uh, it was basically the first anime. And it kind of set the bar, it set the style of anime, most animes that came after it. Uh, but this one is in color, and it's kind of a, a, a higher budget version of Astro Boy. And after watching a few episodes... Again, a bit of a disappointment because the old black and white Astro Boy was, um, it was fun and it was also very violent in that Astro Boy was allowed to kill robots because they were machines in that sense. It was kind of the same way that Ninja Turtles got away with violence in the 90s because they fought the foot soldiers that which were just playing robots. Uh, and so they would, you know, chunk their head off and you just see the wires spark. Same thing with the old black and white Astro Boy. There was a lot of action and, and violence and smashing robots. But in this series, they've made it so that robots are considered sentient and um, this on the same level as human life. So all the robots have to be rescued and saved and turn to, turn to the good side and talk to and try to... It makes it where the stakes aren't as high and it makes it very boring. And also that fun, that fun uh, spirit of the old Astro Boy is not there anymore. It's very dramatic now. It's very kind of slow moving, eyes staring. Oh, what? Did... <gasps> yeah, I kind of wish I hadn't bought this, to be honest with you guys. Because I got, I got through the first disc and I'm just like, oh goodness, it's not Astro Boy anymore. And now I've got all these others. Maybe I'll just give it to a thrift store or something. Uh, all right, so on with the, the games. And I only got a few. I got uh, Starlink, and it's still in its package. It was like a dollar uh, for the Xbox One. Uh, Halo 4 for the 360. Um, Fallout 4 for the Xbox One. And Assassin's Creed. And I think I just got this one as like a throw-in, where there was a deal where I was to get like three for a certain price, and I had two, and this was the only other thing I could find. Um, I probably already have this one. This one is common as dirt. Oh yeah, one last DVD. This one here just came in this little cardboard, uh, but it's the Burns and Allen show. And that's actually George Burns and Gracie Allen, the George and Gracie comedy series, the radio comedy series from the 1940s, which I wasn't even aware that they made the transition over to TV. Um, well, you got four episodes here, and I'm kind of interested to see if they have that closet that uh, you open the door and everything falls <laughs> Them, uh, that was in every episode. Uh, yeah, I, I know Jack Benny made the uh, transition over to TV. As a matter of fact, he was probably more well known for his TV uh, acting than, than radio, but I didn't know George and Gracie. Yeah, and that's what the Wells were named after in uh, The Journey Home. I think it was, yeah, I think it was called The Journey Home in Star Trek, the movie. Uh, yeah, very interested to see what this is like. All right, so that does it for the DVDs and video games. Uh, comic books. And these I got for all of them for 50 cents to a dollar. Uh, starting with Gru the Wanderer. And anytime I see a Gru comic that I don't already have, I try to grab it. 
because this one is historic in the sense that it's one of the few times that the creator actually retained all of the rights to the character. So whenever he wanted to move to a different publisher or a publisher dropped him, he could just take it to the next one and just take all the properties and all the rights with him. Uh, and in that sense, he was also not beholden to a set schedule by the publisher, which kind of made the um, issues very sporadic. <laughs> I think there was sometimes he only put out like one or two issues in a year, but uh, and which is surprising for Sergio Aragones because he was such a fast artist. Oh my goodness. Uh, if you don't know, he was an, the artist that did those um, scribble comic strips in the middle of Mad Magazine that had no... Uh, dialogue at all. It was all visual gags, and he, and that was mostly because for a long time uh, he didn't speak English, speak or write English very well. I think he's gotten to uh, he got to where he was a lot better at it. Uh, I've actually I actually met him, and he was spoke perfect English when I met him. But I, I think when he first came to America, yeah, that that anyway. Um, so grew the wanderer is historic in that sense. I think he was able to. To, to work this kind of deal because of his clout in Mad Magazine. So, uh, yeah. And and basically, this character here, Gru, is a barbarian that just loves adventure and killing. And But he's still a good guy, though, but he's just kind of, he's not very bright. And, uh, yeah, so I, I'm hoping one day I can find a, like, a whole book of Gru, but it went through so many different publishers. The, the, being able to do that would probably be a really hard thing. And then I found two issues of Spider-Man 2099. And you might recognize this, uh, you know, from, what was that, Shattered Dimensions on the Xbox 360. This character here was one of the few from this timeline that, that has remained popular and kind of still in pop culture. Uh, and I think at 2099 uh, line started with Spider-Man too. It was a good story. Uh, so, uh, 2099 just refers to the year of 2099, so it's uh, a lot of Marvel characters, but their descendants or somehow new heroes are born from mutations in the year 2099 that mirror, uh, you know, the ones from the 90s and the 2000s. And so, uh, this, these are kind of getting a little bit harder to find. Uh, the one that I actually liked a little more from 2099 was Hulk. Hulk, 2099. Uh, those are really hard to find, but, you know, it was Hulk, and then there, I think there was also, yeah, there was. There was uh, a Fantastic Four, 2099, and, and a bunch of others. Started with Spider-Man. And, I don't know, it, it, it had a pretty good readership. And then I got this whole handful of Ripley's, believe it or not, uh, comics. And these are actually collections of entries that were in newspapers at some point, but they're set into categories. Fairy tales and literature, feats of wonder, personal hygiene. All right, let's let's read a few out of this. Personal hygiene. Okay, yeah, like see this this square right here. Everything inside this square would have been in a newspaper at some point. Uh, all right, uh, King Louis the Fifteenth from 1710 to 1774 of France employed 40 servants just to care for his wig. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, these make for some really interesting reading. And, and, and the cool thing about it, too, is you're getting all these really interesting um, facts, and you don't have to read, like, chapters and, and books to, to find them. You just It's just like it's all curated right there for you with some really well-done illustrations, too. And I got them for 50 cents a piece. So, yeah, that's... <laughs> I'm really happy to have these in my collection. Um, and then I got this classic literature. And this one, look look at how brittle this, this looks. And that's because this was published in 1944. Right at the end of World War II. And... The first story in this book is Rip Van Winkle, and then uh, the second half is Sleepy Holler. Sleepy Holler. Look at that. And I've already read through it, and fan, 
freaking tastic. It's set in that time period between these two stories are set in that time period in between the Civil War and the Revolutionary War, which is a time period I love to read about. That's, you know, the time period of John Henry and Annie Oakley and um, uh, Pecos Bill and the Siamese Twins and Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett. And it's just like that time period was just perfect. It was like uh, the printing press was just becoming a thing. Newspapers were starting to circulate, and you had the railroad, so in industry was starting to, to really flourish. And it was the folk heroes just started to, you know, it it was perfect. Yeah. A anyway, uh, I love this. And look at, you'll notice something here. See how the colors are? You've got a blue, you've got a red, and a green right there and sometimes the colors bleed over into each other. This was a four collar process printing where each collar had its own roller. So these pages would go through one roller for the black outline, one roller for this collar, one roller for that. It didn't mix the colors. Each collar was its own roller. And I think that was called four collar process back then. And that's why so many superheroes had that, um, that primary collar aesthetic. 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 Uh, you know, the Hulk is green. Uh, Superman is red, blue, and yellow. Uh, you know, the Flash is red and yellow. And it, it, it kind of makes them iconic, you know. But it was all due to the limitations of the color printing at the time. All right, enough about that. All right. Jason and the Argonauts. Uh, this one was published by... Uh, Tome Tome Press, which I don't think I've ever heard of, and this is issue number one, and uh, a lot of the tellings of Jason and the Argonauts. So first, the original telling was destroyed in the Burning of Rome, uh, but excuse me, yeah, Burning of Rome. Um, but uh, the the movie that we all know about uh, is just kind of an amalgamation of the most popular retellings. Um, and, but this, uh, this author right here actually went through a bunch of the retellings and tried to find the, the threads that were the most common between all of them and put them into this comic series. And it's really, really well drawn. I mean, just look at, look at this right here. It's in black and white. And you can tell this character is blonde and this one is brunette. And there's no collar there, but you can tell because they, you know, they just make it, the black and white, just that obvious, that that well done. Let me show, see if I can find some of these, these backgrounds. Look at the backgrounds. Black and white backgrounds. Just beautiful. I think I need to just redo some of these so I can get a little better at my backgrounds. Because that is, that's just gorgeous. Um, and this is just uh, uh, issue number one. I don't know how many it went for. Uh, but in this timeline, Jason was actually trained by the same uh, mentor that trained Hercules. Anyway, uh, I just, yeah, I've already read through this one. I, I, I don't know how I'm going to get, I'm probably going to have to go on eBay to get the rest of them. I really want to read the rest of it. And then one last comic. And this right here was actually just given to me. I got this for free. And from the front of it, it looks like part of a training manual, doesn't it? Well, it kind of is. But then when you open it up, it's also a manga. How do I describe this? Uh... I've already read it. It was a very good read. It was fantastic. Uh, what it is, is you've got this character here that's kind of young, just entering the workforce, and he's frustrated with uh, where his career is going. And so late at night, he goes to get some sushi and um, grabs a handful of chopsticks. And then when he snaps his chopsticks open, right there, this kind of floating elvish character appears. And she is uh, like a fairy of career advice. And the advice that she gives is really, actually really well thought out, out and really good. Uh, it's stuff like uh, don't beat yourself up and keep fighting to try to improve stuff that you're terrible at. Instead, know what your strengths are and try to work your career towards taking advantage of those strengths. Um, also, don't stay rigidly... Uh, focused on your plan, your five-year plan, because 
things change too much. Basically, if the wind changes, don't fight it, adjust your sails. Uh, and things like, um, you look good when you make uh, others look good. It's not all about you. It's some really good stuff. Um, yeah. So it, 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 it's kind of weird to have a book this entertaining, but at the same time, making career advice uh, memorable, easy to remember, and entertaining to read, it, it, it makes me think that there should be more teaching and training material done in this form. I'm sure that, I mean, it would make things a lot easier to learn. It's, yeah, it's a concept that I'm just surprised we haven't taken advantage of a lot more. All right, so that does it for the comics. Also, one cookbook. Joys of Jello <laughs> for a dollar. And recently I have been on the lookout for weird depression era gelatin recipes and I found a few cookbooks with a page or two dedicated to it, but I now have an entire book dedicated to it. Now, some of these are just your standard fare, delicious uh, dessert gelatin recipes, but then when you get to the part of the book, that says salads, gelatin salads. You'll start seeing what I'm <laughs> more trying to find. Like this right here, those are barbecue gelatin cubes added to this salad right here. <laughs> Look at this one right here. We've got a lime uh, gelatin that's got bell peppers and cauliflower in it. Right, right there, yeah. Uh, look at this one right here. This one is just called Ring around the tuna. Ring around the tuna. You see the olives in there? In the lime? Right there. Uh, I just really, really want to try these. This, it just screams YouTube. All right, you see this one right here that has that creamy look to it? Let me read you what it says above it. Mayonnaise makes the salad creamy. Right there. See, it says that. Yeah, there, there's recipes in here that mix jello and mayonnaise. <laughs> I gotta stop cackling. Uh, I'm just so happy to have found this. And yes, you will see this book again. <laughs> Probably a few times. Um, I got a couple of dishes. And this is um, Owen's, Owen's Corning. And so now I've got a casserole dish that's small enough to put into a toaster oven. Uh, campers love these things. <laughs> and I'm no exception. Uh, it's, it's American made and it's... You know, it's a stoneware that can be put in the microwave. It can be used on the eye of a, of a stove. Uh, just fan-freaking-tastic. So I've got a, I'm starting to get a whole collection of Owens Corning. It's, it's awesome. And this one is, uh, this is the one I made the uh, mulberry jam in. And it's got that old-fashioned, I think this is called uh, cornflower design, blue cornflower design on it. And, uh, yeah. All right. So I also got... A couple of coffee mugs. Uh, this one, I think, probably came in one of those basket packs uh, with all the marshmallows and Hershey bars and everything, you know, the little gift baskets, and th these usually come in them. But, yeah, when the weather gets cold in the Christmas season and I want to make some hot chocolate, now I've got the perfect mug to make it in. Uh, and then this one, just it's just a cool. I love the collar. And look at that. It's got the glaze ends right here at this line. And it's got that, it, it kind of breaks things up and just makes it look cool. And it's huge. Oh my goodness. Uh, a few knives. I got a new filleting knife. This is, I've got one, you know, for the studio. And now this one's going to stay in the camper. Uh, it comes with its own sheath. It's got a nice heavy feel to the, to the grip there. And look at the blade. The blade is, it's got that flex to it like a good, flag knife should have but it's also got some thickness there too and uh so i've already used it used it on those catfish that i caught out of the river it's great uh got this knife this is not a fold-up knife uh i got it mostly just for like cutting up steak and stuff when i'm on the road or you know I, anyway it's great uh and the draw knife you guys i i put that in the last video when I, when I actually found this. And I've got to work on this handle because that thing is, yeah, this this rigged up part right here is gonna really dig into your hand if you really use it for a long time. See, it, it'll just dig right in there. 
Uh, I've gotten a few ideas of how I'm going to fix it. I'm going to get like, um, I think, hope this works, a, a file handle. Uh, because they sell those separate than the file and they're about that same exact shape. And then I'm just going to drill the middle of it out big enough to, um, to put over this. And then get uh, some kind of metal disc, maybe a washer or something, put that over here and then mushroom out this. I'm going to have to cut this and then mushroom it out so that it holds the, um, it holds the handle on. And I'm probably going to put some good epoxy on the inside of the handle too so it'll just keep it on there nice and stiff. Uh, this side right here is perfectly fine though. Uh, all right, and one last thing, I got a uh, a new multi-tool, which is actually right here on my belt. Um, this this is the one I got at Trader Baker's, and it was only $3, and it's nice, and I'm probably going to put it in with my bag that I do all my other fishing stuff, have all my other fishing stuff in, but I'm not loving this one because it's just so stiff. You just really got to... Uh, and when you're... You know, in the middle of doing something where you need a tool, you don't want to have to struggle with your tool just to open it. Um, I'm not going to throw it away, but yeah, I'm not I'm not loving the, the grip either. It kind of digs into your hand right there. And then when you go to close it, look at this. It, now it's closed, but it's still wide open. So now you've got to squeeze it to get it small enough to fit back into the sheath. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's a struggle. Uh, I'm not, I'm not caring for that one. This though, um, I'm wearing this on my belt that the, the Look how easy that opens up. And uh, the grip has got that nice smooth plastic all the way around. Uh, been wearing this for a few days now and already had to pull it out for a few things and it's just folds right back up, just like that. Put it right back in the belt. Uh, got that one for $5 at the flea market. So now that's in my little everyday carry tool bag. That's it, that's everything I bought at the flea market. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this. Now. The announcements. Where am I going next? Well, first off, right after I'm done taking this video, I'm going to head over to the Great Smoky Flea Market and try to cordon off a spot to work this weekend. So I don't know if I'll be out front or maybe out back. Either way, I'm going to do my best to have a spot and work this weekend at the Great Smoky Flea Market in Kodak, Tennessee. So uh, yeah, come find me there. Uh, then after that is going to be the 4th of July weekend, and uh, I will be going back to Atlanta for that. Uh, but I, I will only be working one show this year because Kennesaw is crossing up with Marietta and Auburn canceled. Uh, so the only day I'm going to be working out there is going to be July 3rd, which is a Saturday, and it's going to be at the Marietta Square. And I think they're calling it uh, Marietta 4th in the Park, even though it's going to be on the 3rd. So to my friends out there in Atlanta, uh, if you've got Saturday, July 3rd off and you want to go do something fun that is very patriotic themed and a very like old, old area, because I mean, Marietta was the only part of Atlanta that survived the Civil War. You can still see old craggy bricks that are well over 100 years old out there in Marietta Square. <clears throat> all right, I digress. Yeah, to my, all my friends out in Atlanta. Come on out and see me at the Marietta Square July 3rd. Uh, and then, guys, right after that, I think it's only 15 days from today. Three Rivers Festival in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I got my confirmation email. Definitely going to be out there, guys. Uh, and Lo is going to be there, too. Uh, now, she can only be there for the second half, the second weekend. Uh, so I'm going to be struggling probably for the first weekend until she gets there. But... I'm so looking forward to getting back to Fort Wayne, Indiana for the Three Rivers Festival. So, yes, come out and see me out there, too. I'm going to keep saying that, aren't I? <laughs> I should just stop. <laughs> also, there is a few new fairs and festivals that I'm going to be doing this year that I've gotten confirmation on. First one is called the Porter County Fair, and that is going to be the week right after the Three Rivers Festival, and it's also in Indiana. Uh, I... Uh, here are the dates. Uh, I don't know a whole lot other than that about it, uh, but I've got a place for my camper and I've bought a spot out there. It's kind of expensive, but uh, yeah, if, you, if you're in Indiana and you know this area, come out and see me. Uh, there, I said it again. All right. Also, this is one I am very excited about. Very excited about. <sighs> Rhythm and Roots music festival in Bristol, Tennessee. Actually, uh, part of it is 
also in Virginia, Bristol, Virginia. It's that city that has that, that uh, state line that runs the middle of it through Bristol and Virginia. Uh, I'm going to be on the uh, Tennessee side. Um, <laughs> I, here, here are the dates for it. Uh, it was kind of expensive and hard to get into, uh, but I, I just got my confirmation like on the 15th. Yeah, that's when I got my confirmation email that everything has gone through. And I definitely have a spot at the Rhythm and Roots. It's going to be a completely new festival, but... Uh, okay, so... <laughs> and last announcement. I just got my new contract from the Appalachian Fair in the mail a few days ago, and I have already signed it, made out the money order, and put it back in the mail. Guys, it's confirmed. If God willing and the creek don't rise, I will have a spot at the Appalachian Fair this year here are the dates once again uh and so i think it was 2018 or 19 i ended up having a bunch of youtubers come out to see me so i'm hoping that happens again so it's all my youtuber friends the tennessee youtuber friends out there guys if you want to come out at any point during the i think it's six days that this fair goes on uh it is great for vlogging between the demolition derby and the live music and the watermelon eating contest and the 4-H club and the the wildlife um, what do they call that walkthrough where they've got the cave and the stuff in the little indoor waterfall it is all very vloggable stuff and while you're there you can come by my booth and see me and get your drawing done and you can do whatever you want to as long as you buy a drawing off of me i don't mind if you use it on your business card your magnets your decals your t-shirts your thumbnails i don't care you know you you can do whatever you want to once you buy a drawing off of me uh so to all my youtuber friends out there in tennessee please uh come to the appalachian fair i think it's in august and come and see me I, i'm gonna stop i'm gushing a little bit now um and I think during that time that uh, I'm going to be parked, my camper parked, in in the yard of Big Joe and Malia from Big Joe and Malia's World. Um, because they live so much closer to the Appalachian Fair, which will make my commute a lot easier. And uh, yeah, and, and Malia has been saying that she really wants me to do this because she's wanting to uh, probably make cooking videos and try out the... Uh, the recipes on me which i can't imagine i would ever not like something that malia cooks but yeah it's going to be an event and i'm really yeah just i'm really hoping it works out so i all you know the youtubers start coming out again to come out and see me and, and vlog about it and all that so there you go i think you can tell i'm a little excited about that one i was so happy to get that that contract in the okay that's it that is it that's it we're done oh oh Yes, the surprise at the end, the weird snack. Let me go get it. Now, a lot of you probably think of Starburst as just being those delicious gummy square candies uh, like this, and they don't really go much beyond that the way Sour Patch Kids have, but they have gotten a little adventurous in a line of Starburst-flavored Jello. So the one I'm going to be trying right now is just the one that says pink. It doesn't even have the name of a... Oh, here it says strawberry. Okay. All pink strawberry. All right. Yeah, if you haven't figured it out yet, I love Jello. It wiggles. All right. Let's see. Does it actually taste like Starburst? Mhm. Mm yes, it does. That is a very, very Starbursty gelatin right there. Okay, guys, if you've enjoyed this, make sure to go ahead and give me that thumbs up like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. Turn on notifications by hitting the bell, going over and selecting all so the bell turns black. I will talk to you down in the comments. Look forward to seeing you on the road at some of these shows. And also look forward to seeing you in the next one. One last thing real quick. I am now at the Smokies Flea Market and I did in fact get a spot out front it's a little bit further down than where i normally am i'm normally down here next to the birdhouses in the farmer's market that's the main entrance front of the indoor area of the building um, but a little bit further down this spot was available so tomorrow and the next day friday and saturday june the 25th 
and 26. This is where I will be from eight in the morning until five in the afternoon. So come out and see me. Uh, yeah, I will probably take Sunday off, but there we go. Uh, and also, I just thought of this on the way here. Somebody asked me about this. Yes, I will be at the Cover Bridge Festival in Bridgeton, Indiana. Uh, I will be just to the left of the old mill next to the log cabin. So somebody was asking about that. All right, that's it.